That's oh, okay. <laughs> What's your name? Oh, hey, I'm Elizabeth. I, nice to meet you. We're glad you could join. Oh, and you emailed me those whatchamacallits, right? So yes. I just gotta log yes. in and then we'll be off to the races. Hello. So I literally oh, I, when yeah, I hold yes. it my seat and I can keep it off. Yeah. yeah. So I literally I just took it out and it's it was on. So okay. Um Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, I don't think he's a Dorsey. Dorsey's a little. Let's see. Oh, he's he's on the outside. Well, you know, I Okay, so I think we're yes. all good to go. Um, Zoom. Um, Okay, this meeting is being live streamed. Okay, I think we're all good. So if you don't want these screens down, I can put them away. And just have folks looking at the. We're gonna use. We're gonna have video at the end. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but I'll have that queued up. So I think we'll be okay. Thank you so much for all your help. I'm happy to help. Yeah. Hopefully we didn't take up too much time and you can make your six o'clock. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. I'm very happy to help. Uh, anything else I can help you with before we take off? No, I think we're all good. All right. And um, Q&A handheld mics to pass around. Uh, yeah. She's got one and then we've got our table mics. So I think we're all good. All right. Yeah, if you're happy, I'm happy. All righty. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh Okay, what do they say this city is called?
It is because she is not up here. Yeah, 
I'm just waiting on the live stream to oh, get started. Okay. Oh, no, we're oh, you're good. You got okay, you got just the, the this is the oh, that's the thing. What we're looking like, so it's a little bit. Delayed, but we know we're confirmed because we have live live. So um, we are ready to go. And then I just put this up as a um, just just perfect. But yeah, I think we're all set. And then yeah, the mics are on. This is also this is also on. Um, I got the little mic over there. And then I think these. Yeah, I think literally you just have to press them and then they turn green. Awesome. Amazing. And I do think in theory, we are off to the races. On June 20th, let you know. All right, okay. Oh, let me see. Is there anything that is in our past? Are you fine with the view? I guess. Fine, right? No, it is. I, I was just trying to make sure none of our stuff was in the back. But yeah, I think we'll. I think we're ready to go. Let me make sure my Zoom settings are. Not hearing anything. Hello? Okay. I just want to make sure it's listening. <laughs> I know this thing. You are so good, and I'm about okay. to get out of your way. It's just front and okay. back there. Sorry, they were all together. Okay, so don't forget to flip to the for his. Okay, okay, <laughs> and you're live whenever. Okay. We have to press play on this. Is that? Or is it, is it, are we already live? Okay. <laughs> no. Oh. Should we press play? This is. Oh no! No, no we should. I don't know. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, should we play this or what? Should, should we play this? No, no, no. This is for the end. Oh, okay. At the end of the when they're signing books. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's just gonna have something playing in the back. Okay, I see. Okay. Are you going to be part of coming to the Arctic Cousin for the Yeah, okay. So I'm just doing the whole thing. Do, should I name okay. everybody in the zone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank 
we, we're all good to go? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. We don't have to hit anything else? No. All right, welcome everybody. It is so uh, beautiful to see you all, um, despite the gross weather outside. Uh, I just wanna thank you for being here. We know that there's, um, there's a problem in academia, which is that everyone has, for all the genius of the place, everyone has the idea to do their events in the third week of April. Uh, so there's like 17 <laughs> different things tonight. Uh, and it means a lot that you all could rally to be here with us. Um, thank you for all the participants for traveling uh, to, to join us for um, our first major conference here at the Institute on Policing, Incarceration and Public Safety. Uh, the conference is titled Citizenship Under Arrest, Collateral Consequences and the Question of Justice. Uh, First of all, I want to thank our colleague, Elizabeth Ross, who has done Herculean labor to bring all of us here safely, came up with the idea for the conference, hand selected all of our participants. Uh, this is <laughs> great. Um, and in many ways, it reflects the vision that comes out of her scholarship and her work uh, as a civil rights lawyer and, and, and a lawyer working um, to think hard about the questions of justice raised by the criminal legal system. So I just wanna thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's my honor, of course, to be here with my dear friend and co-director, uh, the great Elizabeth Hinton, uh, who I think we all can say that we just continue to learn from and uh, admire her vision as a scholar and thinker and a leader. This institute wouldn't exist without her. Uh, I serve at her pleasure. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm just honored to be here with you all. So I did want to say a little bit about the Institute before we um, dive in and a bit about the vision behind why we're doing this work. So uh, many of you who have studied the criminal legal system uh, know that uh, it's been dominated by a certain kind of approach uh, that's grown out of the social sciences. Um, and one that tends to take what my colleague Tommy Shelby calls a medical model approach to questions of justice, crime. Um, it's, that's an approach that doesn't ask really hard questions about the history of how we've arrived at this moment where our society incarcerates more people arguably than any other society in the world. It's a approach that doesn't ask hard normative or moral and ethical questions about what does justice demand of us? What would be a legitimate society, one that's worthy of our affirmation? Uh, and these questions really hit home for all of us. Uh, these questions about collateral consequences because I think they raise in such a stark um, and unavoidable way these hard questions of history, how do we arrive at a world where punishment lasts forever for so many people? And how could we possibly justify such practices? Um, what moral grounds could possibly be mobilized to defend some of the things that we're going to talk about over the next day and a half? Uh, so those are the kinds of questions that our Institute tries to put at the forefront, reconnecting that social scientific approach with this historical, with this normative approach uh, to create a new vision for scholarship in this realm going forward. Beyond that, we are working to have community-led research. So we're working hard with um, directly impacted people for grounding their voices, their theorizations of the problem. Um, we are directly impacted in, in, in some ways. Uh, for me, this comes out of um, my own brother's incarceration and uh, how when he came home, I'll say a little bit more about this tomorrow, but when he came home after serving 15 years in federal prison, watching him struggle to find work, to find housing, to uh, deal with the harassment and humiliation of the probation system. Uh, and it was before the Affordable Care Act. So watching him lose his health insurance uh, as he lost work and ultimately die from the accumulated health issues from that moment. It's a thing that 
I'm still trying to work through personally and intellectually. Uh, and I and I do want to thank you all for being here with me um, as we try to think through these hard questions to prevent that sort of thing from happening to others in the future. Um, last thing I'll say uh, before I turn it over to Elizabeth is that, you know, our research is meant to do work in the world. And our goal isn't to have things cloistered away. Uh, without being able to touch the conversations that people are having on the ground. It's about giving people resources and space to ask questions that they don't usually get to ask when we're called in front of audiences to pretend that we know everything. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a research agenda that's meant to give space for us to think really hard and then go back into the world more richly informed by conversation across boundaries between activists and intellectuals, between scholars and artists, um, between directly impacted people and students, we want to provide that kind of space. And so this is a great experiment in that regard. We are excited that you all are partners on this journey thus far. And I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to introduce the panel. Thank you so much for those beautiful words, Brandon. And um, I just want to remind everybody that we also have a day of programming tomorrow. We have two panels, one at um, 10 a.m. that's interrogating the collateral and collateral consequences, and one at 4 p.m. reimagining justice, a future without collateral consequences. I um, also want to echo Brandon and just thanking um, all the participants for making the journey here and for gracing this campus um, with your expertise and with your knowledge. It's extremely important. And I don't think that there's ever been um, quite a gathering like this at Harvard University. So we are living history, we are making history, and we continue um, in the struggle, the long struggle of our ancestors um, to build a better future. So we are especially lucky and blessed to have um, two major figures um, in this movement here. Um, we are celebrating the publication of the great Dorsey Nunn's book, What Kind of Bird Can Fly? Congratulations, uh, Mr. Nunn. This is really, this event is really meant to celebrate you and interrogate your life's journey, your work, its importance. Um, Dorsey Nunn is hands down one of the most important, I've told, I tell him this every time I see him, one of the most important um, leaders in this movement today. And I know will go down in history. I'm a historian, so we, you will be um, at the center of discussions about how we changed the world and how we dismantled mass incarceration. Um, so let me introduce Dorsey and then I'll um, introduce his interlocutor, the great professor, the genius, in fact, Ruben Jonathan Miller. Um, Dorsey Nunn is the executive director of the Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, co-founder of All of Us or None, an organization of formerly incarcerated people working for their human and civil rights, co-founder of Free at Last, an addiction treatment center, and co-founding member of the FICPFM, the formerly incarcerated and convicted people and their families movement that was actually at the conference in Oakland. I think it was in 20, 2016, the fall 2016 is when I met you and um, many of our other brilliant participants. Since his release in 1991, Dorsey has been at the forefront of formerly incarcerated people's movements to speak in their own voice, transform their lives and communities, and fully participate in all aspects of society, questions that we're going to be exploring over the next two days. Through community organizing and communities directly impacted by incarceration, All of Us Are None originated and continues to expand the Ban the Box campaign, a nationwide effort to eliminate structural discrimination based on conviction history and employment, housing, education, social services, and other areas. The Box on Employment Applications has been banned in 22 states, over 100 cities, and some of the largest corporations in the U.S., Formerly incarcerated himself, Dorsey holds numerous prestigious awards for his more than 40 years of work on prison reform and social justice. And he will be in conversation with um, my friend and colleague, Ruben Jonathan Miller, one of the leading um, thinkers and scholars of the criminal legal system who I have learned a great deal, 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 deal from. And I cannot imagine a better pairing for this conversation and this celebration of Dorsey than Professor Miller. So thank you so much for making the time to be here. 
Ruben Jonathan Miller is an associate professor in the University of Chicago Crown Family School and in the Department of Race, Diaspora, and Indigeneity, and a research professor at the American Bar Foundation. Ruben's research, which focuses on race, punishment, and social welfare policy, is published in journals across the social sciences. In 2021, Miller published Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration, um, an, an incredibly beautiful book. If you have not read it, I encourage you to get it and do so. This book won a number of awards, including the 2023 Michael J. Hindelang Award from the American Society of Criminology, the 2022 Herbert Jacob Book Prize from the Law and Society Association. Halfway Ohm was also a finalist for an LA Times Book Prize and the Pan America John Kenneth Galbraith Award. In 2022, Professor Miller was selected as a MacArthur Fellow, the so-called Genius Grant, with the prize committee noting, quote, Miller is modeling a way to write about his subjects that refuses to reduce them to their hardships, and he is illuminating how the American carceral system reshapes individuals' lives and relationships long after their time has been served. He is now working on a new book on violence and the legacy of Black emancipation across the globe. Please join me in welcoming Dorsey Nunn and Ruben Jonathan. My publicist would get upset. You know, I'm just like, I got to do this for the publicist. And I got to do this for um, Gordon Philanthropy, who gave me five, uh, ordered 500 books that allowed me to give people in my neighborhood and in the community around me an opportunity to actually get access to stuff that other people don't have access to. Well, if y'all not purchasing the book, then maybe uh, you should, because most of the time that I'm giving them away, I'm giving them away to people who can't afford it. And I can assume that this book going to be banned in prisons. Well, you can be sure the book's going to be banned in prisons. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can be sure. <laughs> There's so much in this book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, one, just really grateful. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for, for, for being so kind and, and for the invitation. And Brandon, it's such a pleasure being in your presence. Um, and, and, and Brother Dorsey, you know, just, just thank you for your, for your years of service, your years of service and the, the light that you are. And we'll talk about that service and we'll talk about that light. But the, but the first thing I want to ask you about, really, I want to know about you as a, as a kid. We, you know, we meet you as a nine-year-old in this book. You know, um, can, can you tell me about Darcy? Uh, probably, um, Chile, when people ask me the question about, you know, have I been to prison? They don't take into consideration that I was shaped prior to ever going to prison. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you know, like uh, uh, probably some of my first thoughts uh, around the question of kindergarten. My parents was walking me to school to go to kindergarten not because they didn't think that I can find my way. What they thought was that I was in danger because we moved into a place called Menlo Park that's about five miles from Stanford, right? When we moved in to that neighborhood, the first thing that happened was that 25% of all white people left the community. You know, the first thing I was subject to before I had any language uh, was probably uh, block busting, redlining, and white flight. I didn't have those things going into it, you know. Uh, the uh, Dorsey uh, born to be um, at a certain point uh, a little league, uh, a baseball player like everybody else. Yeah. But what I kept hitting that was defining my uh, 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 identity was these things that was like my first uh, bicycle that I got. The police took it. You know, I can remember walking with my friend Nate. And uh, we was hitting rocks with what we thought was scrap metal that turned out to be a sprinkler that we picked up at the school. And I, and they, they they took me home, my parents, I guess, for the entertainment of the police or for keeping us from juvenile, actually disciplining us at that particular point. Uh, my next incident uh, was jumping over the fence when we kept following white people around to actually get to the, 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 the safer community, the more prosperous community. And uh, I got arrested in a place called The Village. Uh, the other, the last time that I got arrested was for being incorrigible. 
uh, that's there. So like all the things that people told me when I was growing up, that I could be all of these wonderful things. There was a different group of uh, actors in the mix that was doing something different, you know? And I think at the last time that I read, everybody kept talking about the presumption of innocence. At no point was I ever presumed to be innocent. You know, from the point that we moved in and everybody else left, that wasn't a, a presumption of innocence. It was a presumption that somebody's going to do something that's actually contrary to what somebody else has did. Let's talk about the point that you moved in. Let's talk about the neighborhood a little bit. And let's talk about, can we talk about this purple bike that you got? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what, was, what was this bike like? Well, this, this bike was like, a, it was purple, you know, handlebars like there, <laughs> a beautiful seat, you know. It was like, it was like uh, what I wanted. You know, that bike every day, every day until the police took it, <laughs> you know, and, and it was like, you know, it was actually a short period of time. But when you're young, it seemed like a lifetime, you know, and that bike was a, a lot uh, for me, uh, a lot, you know, and at a certain point when the, they turned it over and didn't see no serial numbers yeah. on the bottom of the frame, yeah. they just assumed that it was stolen. Yeah. You know, uh, you could assume the, a number of other stuff yeah. like it was a used bicycle and people scraped off the, 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 the serial number. They could uh, 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 assume that if they had this kind of white flight that was happening, people could have left the bicycle. It could have been a whole bunch of things they could have assumed. And, you know, and what I assumed uh, on a real basis, that my father loved me enough yeah. to give me a bike. Yeah. So, you know, and my father was a, a person who worked two jobs. Yeah. You know, and at this point, I can even embrace that more because I have never met, you know, my father hadn't uh, stole anything in front of me. Uh, I was one of the few kids on the block that had a father. You know, if anything, I, you know, if I feel something about my father, I felt like he uh, gave too much to too many. Mm. Mm. You know, because like my home was a home that everybody came to, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and if he took anything, it was paper and pencils. Because I know he provided stuff for people in school also. Let's talk, let's talk about your father for a hot second. You know, there's a beautiful passage in the very first chapter. Um, and, and, and you're thinking about the bike. You're thinking about the loss of the bike. You're also thinking about the many moves that you had to make. So your father, you had moved three times in that, in that neighborhood. And your father had, you, you know, had, had to move at, at, at one point because of bills. You know, many of us relate to that. Many of us relate to, 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 to the loss and experience of poverty and what it means and how it's things... But your father was trying to, he was shielding you through much of that. Moved again, moved again. And you say, in retrospect, I, 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 I believe that with all those whiplashing moves, my father was chasing a better way of living for us kids, a safer environment. He was always aspiring to that community barely within reach. The book is beautiful. He was always aspiring to that community barely within reach, the wider one, the one that didn't want us, is what you said. Um. It won't be now because the same house that my dad bought, I still live in. Yeah. And I stayed probably less than a mile step in my front yard. Uh, that house that he bought for $18,000 uh, is less than a step in my front yard. I can see Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that $16,000 house now is worth over a million dollars. And, you know, and I got three brothers out there probably three times a week playing pinochle because I got tired of people knocking on the door and asking me if I want to sell. You know, and if, you know, you know, I, I got to the point where, you know, uh, I should have probably laid out some ripple bottles, some core 45, put it in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> should have did some stuff with that. <laughs> but, you know, but, but the reality of it was that uh, uh, whatever my father turned out to be, some parts of that, that they was also breaking him down. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you know, like all of us can look in this room. Most of us can look in this room and say, like, we're so proud to be black. But the reality of it was, I was born in 1951. And we was born Negroes. So we had to go through transition, you know, and other transitions that I think that we can uh, 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 go for. I can remember when we used to just call people convicts. We call them based on whatever crime they committed. Right on through here, there's an, another emerging group of people. And in that emerging group of people, they're saying that they're returning citizens. And they're saying that they formed the incarcerated. And we are a different group of people than we had, you know. Mm -hmm. And that right there, uh, if you say yourself, if you call yourself a formerly incarcerated person, you know, do you know your history? Do you know that Divine Pryor and Eddie Ellis actually put some stuff from his skin in the game to teach y'all how to say that? 
you know, uh, do y'all recognize, you know, when y'all talk about prison abolition, it was an obscure term out of a Mike Davis book. And by the way, uh, about time I got to prison, uh, I was reading it about the third grade level. You know, I didn't drop out at the third grade. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so at a certain point, yeah. when he was doing white flight, it also impacted uh, educational systems. Yeah. It impacted uh, uh, economic situation. Yeah. It impacted how we did business and how we didn't do business and what things was accountable. How do you get uh, 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 food shortages and in, 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 in the, the, the desert that are around the question of food? Yeah. All of that. Um, mm. well, it shows up in Shades of Life, right? Um, by the way, uh, sometimes when I'm talking, I, I actually start feeling stuff. And what when I start feeling stuff, most of the time that what comes out of my mouth, and if I hesitate, it's because I respect uh, what y'all doing so much that I'm trying not to curse. <laughs> you know, because like, you know, like, how do you... <laughs> you know, because like, like at, 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 at a way, I, I really want to, to actually connect uh, with uh, with the first chapter of this book is called uh, 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 Innocence Unavailable and uh, Guilt Not Required. I'm talking about the presumption that at no point it gave to me. And at the presumption of actually defining that stuff, you can see it in your day-to-day -day life. You can see it uh, when somebody's coming to you, to, to you and nine, more than 90% of the time, people are pleading guilty. What is the brother doing pleading guilty? And some of them pleading guilty, they ain't did anything. They saying that presumption doesn't apply. And when a person serves you that deal, I got lawyers in the room too. Y'all know what the deal that they, you know, <laughs> they serve you, you know, hey, you know, you, you're going to get 25 years. And, you know, like right now, I, I think that you're sort of dark, <laughs> but they don't say it that way, <laughs> you know. And I can remember all of those times that other people went away. And it was there. But if you're talking about my childhood, my childhood uh, initially uh, started out uh, with all the dreams. You know, when the person police took the bike, I was half in to like, did Santa Claus really exist? Yeah. You know, uh, I, I was into that stuff. But about the time that I got arrested, I showed up to, in court wearing a purple crush of velvet suit, black patent leather shoes, <laughs> a collar flipped down on me. <laughs> You know, because that's the only clothes that I had to wear. I, I was dressed like the other brothers on the street. And my homeboys behind me was dressed in lime green, burnt orange. <laughs> so it's like it was that era. But, you know, like growing up, um, it wasn't until I got to prison and I, I thought about the sacrifices of my father. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I you know, I thought about, yeah. I hadn't seen my father cry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The first time uh, I didn't see my father cry until I told, told him uh, I wasn't going to snitch. My father seen what was ahead of me before I could see what was ahead of me. You know, and uh, I can tell you that uh, I thought that I was grown at the time that I went to prison. It was many things that I was, I was still had baby fat. Uh, when I was arrested at the point that I was arrested, I was arrested um, less than a year uh, since the, uh, the shootout in, in, in Marin County and Jonathan died, less than a year from uh, 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 the death of George Jackson, less than a year from the Attica Rebellion, uh, uh, probably less than four or five years until the uh, 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 SLA emerged from prison. So, you know, and uh, in a book I have, I, I think in chapter three or four, it was a commitment to kill. And I need to say the commitment to kill should have been named something a, a real more fully as an understanding. Commitment uh, to kill in order to live because what people put me into was a situation that was extremely violent. We're, 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 I, I, I want to go there. I absolutely want to go there. But but but, there, but there's something really important about your political analysis that I want to sit on, sit with for a second. You know, you're very careful about the language that you use. You know, you talk about cages. You talk about, you call the neighborhood. You First of all, it's East Menlo Park. You say it wasn't Menlo Park. Like you talk about the ways that the neighborhood 
uh, push people into 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 cycles of violence, into incarceration. And so, and so, and so, can can you talk about that? Well, oh, I was trained to go to prison before I got there. I knew about. I get. I got there. I knew I was supposed to lift three hundred pounds to join the Hogs Club. I knew that uh, uh, if things happened and people approached me, I needed to fight. All of those things happened before I got to prison. And uh, just like, you know, like uh, uh, I got a lot of Southern homeboys, you know, and I love them. Probably they don't recognize that where I grew up at in San Mateo County, uh, they only had two elected countywide black people in the history of the state. They don't necessarily see that that oppression can also apply in California. You know, like when 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 Georgia actually uh, uh, decided to, to to do away with uh, uh, the Constitution and remove that from uh, 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 slavery and involuntary servitude, I'm in a fight of my life for it in California because most people don't see it. You know, and you know, like I, I really want to sell the book, but what I really want to do is challenge a narrative that's so oppressive that it renders slavery invisible. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, and by the way, uh, when I was invited to Harvard, the thing that was really attractive is that I got heroes all around and people that I met that actually we did work with. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, Norris, you know, uh, you know, like homeboy, how many years did they go before they figured out they needed a, a, a 10 year uh, need more than 10 people to make a decision about a person's life. You know, Desmond is going to be here. So what happened? You know, how long, you know, 2000 election and then Desmond come along. Right now, to the most part, people think they're trying to save me. But they can't recognize that we could be trying to save y'all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because like at a certain point since 2000, uh, we didn't actually have uh, vote voting rights in the state of Florida. You know, since, you know, forever, uh, Jim Crow, Norris didn't have the right to have 10 people, uh, uh, 12 people uh, to vote for a conviction verdict because of Napoleonic law. You know, so what happens? And you know what? I think that somebody really screwed up. They taught me how to read. And they allowed brothers to actually intersect with me while I was in prison that taught me how to read. Yeah. You know, I moved from uh, uh, Louis Lamar. Uh, cowboy books, you know, I guess probably I don't know what I was doing with that shit. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I was going to get a horse. <laughs> it wasn't like I was going to get any of that stuff, you know. And, and then being that I was 19, going through my 20s, and I went all the way through my 20s, my hormones was raging. I got into girly magazines for a couple years, and then these brothers started feeding me stuff. Yeah. You know, and every once in a while, you know, um, educated people speak in such a way that Sometimes they disregard other people may not understand the language. So like probably the first book they got me to read was Soul on Ice. And they was talking about uh, super uh, masculinity, auto femininity. Uh, now, where in the hell was I supposed to learn about that when he was just teaching me Ron, Dick, Ron, Jane, and jumping? <laughs> you know, and what, what am I supposed to do even after I got out of prison? And, and I ran into, you know, uh, Professor Dylan Rodriguez, who still signs his, uh, his end of his thing with a George Jackson quote. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they talked about, you know, uh, I was thinking about, man, I learned how to read. I got a little bit of stuff. And they start talking about a Gemini. And I was saying, like, what? Well, who are they talking to? <laughs> you know, are they talking to, you know, the same group of people that we're supposed to be organizing in terms of mass to actually secure our freedom? So I'm hoping that this book challenges some of those notions and challenges it in a way that people can actually actually digest some of the things I'm saying. Can we stay with who they're talking to for a second? I mean, part of, part of the, I think the genius of, of, of what you do, part of the brilliance of what you do is your ability to connect, your ability to draw people together. And, 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 and you know, you have a really, you have, a really a student analysis both in the moment and later so so the Eldridge Cleaver book you know when when you when you run the men's group you offer a critique of the Eldridge Cleaver book right away you right right away that's when they like when I read the Eldridge Cleaver book um and I knew that everybody was holding Eldridge and a whole bunch of Panthers up 
I read Soul on Ice, what I came to was Elders with the Raiders. And I went out to the yard and it's like, <laughs> you know, I went out to the yard and it's like my elders and a whole bunch of other people. And I said, man, I think that homeboy was guilty of rape. You know, I don't know if we can just justify that. <laughs> That's what I said, you know, and as a result of me actually living up on my principles, what they gave me was an opportunity to teach the next political education class. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, because like, you know, I told the truth, even though, I was fearful at telling the truth. And the other thing that they can they they knew was that being that I was uh, not mimicking information, I actually started embracing it and started incorporating what I was learning. Well, this this is why I want to stay stay with like what I think is the brilliance of your political analysis that starts early on with you. So 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 right now you're 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 you're, you're talking to us about you know I, I really wasn't reading very well these sorts of things and that's I think that's true. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying anything about, like I'm not doubting that in any way. But 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 your political analysis was 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 brilliant early on. You said the thing that you learned early on was to rebel, rebel against everything, rebel against everything, push back against everything. You saw, you were looking at your brother Ronald pushing back against everything, the, 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 this, despite what was happening. You know these things, these things. So all of this was the training for prison, but also there's a kind of training for activism that's happening in this bubble uh, while while you're growing up that you, that you share with us in this book. It, like um. Hmm. Man, my, um, you know, I must heard somebody say that ignorance was bliss. What happened when you actually breached that veil? <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 it moves you in such a way uh, that ignorance is unacceptable. You know, so like, um, I loved my brother Ronald. And at a certain point, my brother Ronald and my brother Pat was both in San Quentin with me. Yeah. About the time they arrived at San Quentin from uh, being on the streets, being at Vacaville and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and my, I was in uh, with Ronald when he was in, uh, in, in Vacaville, when I seen him probably four years later. Uh, nobody thought that that was, uh, that, that was my older brothers. They thought that it, they was, my younger brothers. And for a minute, I was looking at you like, I ain't, I ain't bigger than they are still. And, you know, you know, like that's the reason I rejected being a sports player because I thought I was, you know, 50% pygmy. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to dunk the basketball. I wasn't going to be. <laughs> well, I'm just playing with y'all. <laughs> you know, what happens to me? That, that stuff ain't working for me, you know? And, and they only offered me sports stuff. But my brother Ronald, uh, when I thought that uh, he wasn't conscious, there were certain things that he was very much conscious of. He had a whole bunch of kids about a whole bunch of different women. And I was talking to him one day, and he named off all of their birthdays. That came from my father. That didn't come from Ronald. He was hearing stuff. You know, when uh, 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 they had to watch riot, uh, Ronald was breaking out the windows down in my little community. Yeah. He was there. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, even like uh, when he became an addict. Uh, and I, you know, I built a drug program and, and I asked him, I said, Ronald, you didn't, you, 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 you didn't did dope with five or six generations of people. And I asked him a, a real question. I said, well, how come you, you know, I got a drug program. Why don't you just come into my drug program? Um, and I said, why don't you come? And he said that he had been uh, doing uh, drugs since Easter Sunday, 1968, and he was scared of pain. Mm -hmm. And I said, they got something called methadone, and somebody sits on my board that distributes that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Ronald got, got came into my program, and he got ready to leave. Uh, I would tell him he can leave with his stuff in a plastic bag or he can leave uh, driving my Cadillac. Mm. So like, you know, like the, the, I gave Ronald uh, my Cadillac Eldorado so he can stay in recovery, you know? And uh, and I know that he would take stuff like, you know, he didn't have no tummy heel figure socks. That was my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but all the rest of it, uh, at times we got into arguments 
the arguments that we got into was after we got pads getting ready to fight, the arguments we got into was that he was an educated person. He'll start talking to me about Mao Tom. He'll start talking to me about Che Guevara. And it was like, oh, now you're going to like get there with me and you took my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like it, it, it was there, but at the same time, um, um, when he stopped using, uh, I could tell, not based on what he was telling me, was the money that he was borrowing, he gave it back and he mm -hmm. paid me back. Mm -hmm. So like the thing that I probably got to tell you that when I was coming through prison uh, uh, and I was coming through those brothers that was uh, teaching me a whole bunch, the social criteria of the truth is a practice. Whatever you fucking say, I don't really care about it. It's how do you treat me and how do you practice it? Excuse me. Still cussing uh, a lot. This is your show. This is your show. Oh, <laughs> your whole, uh, my book, there's some cuss words in there too. <laughs> but, you know, uh, and I, you know, in writing the book, the first thing I had to do is that I knew that somebody was going to write about me. I knew that if nothing more, Somebody was gonna write a bitch where he said, "Hey, he's cool," <laughs> or "He ain't cool." I knew somebody was gonna write about me. What I'd anticipate was writing a book, and I didn't anticipate that it would take me four years to do it. You know, and the book comes from a certain thing: is that when my brother Ronald died, uh, a person who visited me in prison named Kathy Labriola uh, gave me every letter that uh, that I wrote her from 1974 to 1981, and in those letters. It was a whole bunch of different stuff in those letters. That's how come I can say 1977. That was something that 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 jumped out in a letter that I wrote, and I said, "Jeromo just hit the yard," and you know, uh, he um, he asked me to do this, and you know, I did this, and uh, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'm sad that I can't get out my cell right now, but that that wasn't a real big deal, uh, and. Uh, and what, 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 what he gave me, there was these kernels that people gave me stuff in prison. Yeah. You know, like, how about this? Uh, after Rachel McGee got in the killed and shot up in the, in, the, in the store, what did he call what he did? When I came in, everybody in prison said what Rachel McGee called uh, the act that he did and he participated in in Marin County Courthouse, he called it a slave rebellion. What was people making a statement and what they were they saying when they had an Attica rebellion? What were they saying? You know, they were saying, they said that we were human beings. They were saying stuff, right? Uh, what happens with that part of the information yeah. that, uh, man, you know, I seen, uh, I seen Geronimo cry because they, he ran into homeless people. This man has set out his life. I seen my homies getting out that actually trained me that they actually uh, uh, gave up their lives and actually fought for something. How did they reckon in with what we live in and how we do in, in society right now? You know, um, mm. you know, like some parts of it, like Paul, uh, that's the next director of legal services for prisons with children. He's going to be a prominent member. You know, you know, all of us are none, and he's actually going to make some decisions. You know, and what I need to tell everybody is that I'm not tired. What I think is that we're in a protracted struggle, and younger people got to have a space where they can actually uh, do that stuff. Uh, took uh, took uh, me and Hamdia uh, Hooks Abdullah took us six years to, to buy a building for $2.5 million. The day after we made the last mortgage payment, Hamdia retired in less than a year, I did too. So we weren't buying the building for us, we were buying the building for the next people that we assumed can actually do the work. You know, so like, that's, you know, that's, that's what it was. And by the way, that bite that they took, uh, uh, last, uh, the second December, the second Saturday in December, probably for 11 years, 12 years, that I give away bicycles to children with incarcerated parents. You know, mm -hmm. and that last bicycle last year, I, I gave away 
or we gave away, homie, because it ain't just me by myself. We gave away 200 and, 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 and uh, I think it's 87 or 67 bicycles. We didn't gave away over 200 bicycles a year for the last five years. And we go into prison and search those people out. And we ain't telling no bullshit story about Santa Claus. We saying that, you, you, you know, uh, your father or your mother sent you a bicycle because like when we first got the bicycles that was uh, uh, given to us by prisoners. Uh... Andrea? Oh, I just want to see you. I did <laughs> I just making you out in the back of the room. I'm sorry. You can keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to bust y'all. It's good to see you. <laughs> God. When we was giving away the bicycles, we was telling that story. When we first got the bicycles, people in San Quentin hit the bicycles around because they had new bicycles. And uh, we went up there and uh, and we got the bicycles. On the way out of prison, the wardens told told us, uh, tell tell your community that San Quentin uh, really appreciate them and and we're gonna be there for them. And I figured, like, why would I go and tell like our kids that yeah. the warden loves them? You know, like they need to know their parents love them. Yeah. You know, it's so like you know, like it didn't it didn't didn't mix. You know, and the person who gave me the bike and walked me out was a person by the name of Hattie Kitchen, right? Uh, and, and when she walked me out, she came in, and I can remember asking her to stay because they were shooting black people off the gun rail. And by the time that I came back and see her again, she was a a, 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 a lieutenant. And uh, then the next time that I, I ran across her, uh, it was because somebody had killed her, her grandson. Mm -hmm. The police had killed her grandson. Uh, and I, I was on the phone, and she said, uh, my name is Addie Kitchen. And I said, Addie, is that you? You know, because like, you know, uh, until we figure out like, uh, none of us is safe if we ain't all safe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so at a certain point when I talk about that presumption that's not there, yeah. how many times does somebody get killed and we presume that they're guilty just because they got shot? <laughs> you know, we you know, we look at their record and don't look at the police record. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's like, it, it's all of that stuff. But you know, like, um, and I'm living too much in that jail stuff because I did have some accomplishments that actually. Uh, you have plenty. You have plenty. You it, okay. I just, because yeah, like, you know, I didn't get in pain and I'd start cussing like a sailor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, you know, because like at a certain point, uh, um, what my elders in prison gave me. was something so potent that when I got out, I couldn't do anything else other than follow that. Follow that. You know, I had um, three years when I was an addict. I've been home since 1981. Right, I stopped being an addict. I built one of the largest programs, the drug programs in San Mateo County. You know, and then, you know, like uh, being that, you know, uh, a lot of the people I was hanging out with they were women, and uh, and at first I thought I was going to be building a drug program for uh, men. Then we start thinking about who were attached to our kids. So the first thing that we did was open up a women's facility that can actually uh, so they can actually keep their kids. So at free at last, that was the first thing we did. Uh, me and Davis Lewis uh, left the room, and the women and the rest of the table had a vote, and uh, and they voted that we was going to do a, a treatment center for women. <laughs> And we agreed to it, you know. Yeah, you know, so this, this is, this is. I, I think the reason why I've been thinking about the childhood, the neighborhood, the time inside, is because it tells us so much about, in many ways, the kinds of political action that you take later. It tells us so much about your approach. I mean, so, so, so you say in the book, there's this, this, this line in the book where you were thinking about the kinds of brothers who you were drawn to, and you say some people were drawn to, some people were drawn to religion. I was drawn to revolution, the revolutionaries. And 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 then and then and then and then we see we see the seeds of that revolution on the inside with the kinds of things you participate in. So 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 this is the last thing I'll say about the inside, but because I, I want to use it to move to move to the outside, which is I'm thinking about there's there's this moment in the book where you're talking about um, 
a, a, a riot that, that that you all started because I, I don't really want I want to talk about this as a bridge. So just give me one second. So so there, there, there's a riot that that starts. You all say tear gas, tear gas, send down the tear gas. And at a certain point, like when he was in prison and and uh and I was in the hole, and, and at a certain point, they 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 was uh, uh threatening us. And uh, what we do, what we start doing, was rattling the bars and we was yelling for tear gas. <laughs> And then after they shot tear gas, somebody asked, can you do 100 push-ups in this shit? You know, and uh, that happened uh, right before uh, the death of uh, Earl Sanders, which was a, a correctional official. Because at a certain point, uh, what happens uh, when we start fighting back? You know, all the stuff that I, that I, I grew to do, uh, I came out of prison and I thought that I'd be taking military actions. It was the education that gave me a different way out. I was going to ask you this. So now, <laughs> how, do you, how do you go? How do you go from somebody who's doing push-ups and tear gas, right, to, 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 to somebody who's, who's opening uh, the, the, the larger substance abuse treatment, uh, who's, 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 who's working with women, who's, who's, who's thinking about the needs of, 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 of the people that, that you're encountering? How do you go from, from and these, I think these things are not disconnected. I think they are deeply connected. Well, the, the thing that we did at, at Free at Last, it was a, a number of the things that we did. We had a commitment to do three things. One thing that we had a commitment to do was to stop uh, 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 the crack epidemic in our community. The second thing that we had to do, uh, want to do, was to stop the AIDS pandemic that was uh, uh, ravaging our community. And the third thing that we want to do was stop the violence. Yeah. Um, stop the violence for people who's dying in our community. We started that 30 years ago. Last year was the first year that we didn't have a murder in East Palo Alto when it was named the murder capital of the United States. You know, some of my homies that started out on the journey is no longer around. They have been murdered. So it wasn't like, you know, when we doing stuff like stopping the, uh, the violence in our community, I knew, I knew from prison, uh, uh, organizing. I was taught organizing. Uh, people had prepared me to come out here to do something, yeah. you know. And I can absolutely tell you, uh, short short of just a week, maybe three or four months of doing other work, I have not had a job fighting for anything other than the full restoration of civil and human rights for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. Yeah. That was yeah. all of it, yeah. you know. So, like, when I'm, when I'm stepping back and seeing, like, I'm stepping back because I want to challenge a narrative that people don't don't think about. And uh, when I'm, you know, uh, by the way, you know, some parts of this conference, you know, if I can get to the real, how about this? Uh, there was two presumptions uh, that I couldn't have: a presumption of innocence, and I couldn't necessarily have a presumption of rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah, right. Because like. Uh, the structural racism, the structural uh, discrimination and all the rest of that stuff actually uh, speaks to that presumption not being real for some of us, right? So what happens when I actually get intellectually free? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I get intellectually free, what I can tell y'all, if I didn't serve my time, I don't owe you a motherfucking thing. Right. Okay. I, I'm not owing you shit. I'm not owning it. Or none of the rest of that stuff. So, like at a certain point, my struggle was to teach my homies how not to be silent and to be as noisy as they possibly can, and to make a demand on the system that allows them to actually solve their problems and care for our community. That's what I, I do on a regular basis. The militant and radical care. It's a talk, talk to how you and 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 the path into it is so is so clear and it's so beautiful and so powerful. So now I want to ask you about things that you've done on the outside. I want to ask you about legal services for prisons with children. I want to ask you about all of us and I want to ask you about all these things. Legal services for prisons for children, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I'm just going to flat out say it. I interviewed, uh, uh, I, I was in a, doing a radio interview on K-Pool and I was interviewing Ellen Berry. Uh, 
And she told about she uh I was interviewing her, you know, and I guess because I didn't have an interest to do anything, no manipulation, none of that shit. She told me about uh people being sterilized in women prisons. And uh when she mentioned OBGYN, I thought it was a prison gang. Didn't know it. I just I didn't know it. And it was like it was a segment that I had struggled around that I didn't actually thought that I grasped it, but I didn't grasp uh, what they were doing when they were sterilizing people. And I had met other women who said they had been sterilized by these in prison. But you know, like when, when you're there, you just going going away with it. And uh, and I didn't know at the time that I was interviewing her that ultimately I would go to work there, uh, and ultimately she would shift what I was I was doing. And the, the conscious shift was that I started suing and uh, started engaging in the struggle to actually uh, take care of the healthcare needs for women in prison. I, that was more of my career and me working in, 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 in standing in front of San Quentin because when I was released in San Quentin for the first six years that I got out, I was, uh, uh, I was suing them and I was operating less than 100 yards from the prison I walked out. It wasn't like I started to fight someday. I started to fight immediately. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, so it's like, you know, some parts of uh, 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 the stuff that I, I, I talked about in the book is uh, uh, how do brothers love each other inside of prison? Yes. They feed them and they give them revolutionary love and they give them information that they can actually sustain themselves with. You know, it wasn't just uh, uh, Geronimo that came through, it was Jaleel that came through. It was a... Uh, 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 Gilbert that came through that taught me, you know, how much, you know, how much putting a cap of weed that I sell weed and nothing. All of that stuff, it was helpful in terms of organizing. And I was learning organizing in a real productive way. Now, uh, generally when I'm sitting down talking to people with or without education, some things that they say to me, uh, they don't recognize that I'm back there and uh, we into it. So, when people say uh, the prison industrial complex, an obscure term in a Mike Davis book, that me, Ruthie Gilmore, Angela Davis, Julia Sotsbury, Dylan Rodriguez, George Galvis, and a number of people start teaching people how to say that. Because we want to have a frame in which we can actually uh, 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 hold the concept that would come along a little bit later uh, by Michelle Alexander and I'm in her book. Uh, and in that concept, she started talking about mass incarceration. You know, and she, by the way, she, I think she she uh, leads into my book. Uh, and Angela Davis has got a, a blurb in the book, and Cornel Wells got a blurb blurb in the book. Uh, uh, so it's like you know, uh, but that's that's there when uh, 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 these women came home from a uh, 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 prison, uh, especially a uh, federal prison like Hamdia, Linda. Uh, Donna Wilmau and a number of them. Uh, we we were meeting in, in, at, at legal services for prisons with children because we hired them. And when we hired them, we got four or five people in the room. We started hatching all kind of ideas, yeah. you know. And it wasn't like I was a revolutionary alone, you know. Because sometimes I had some man. I was an addict, and everybody thought I was a poor addict because I started talking about revolution. You know, and I didn't see simply see somebody stealing somebody's stuff. By the time I got out there, I was using terms like expropriation, <laughs> still stealing somebody's shit. <laughs> you know, I had real terms to justify that. <laughs> you know, I had that could rest comfortably, but you know, the other part of it is, is that when I got out, uh, I no longer fit in the pool hall. Mm -hmm. And my ambitions was a little bit more developed, mm -hmm. and my commitment to ongoing struggle was a little bit more there. Your ambitions were 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 were, were never throughout the book. What, 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 I know you through the book. I should say this. And so, reading the book, it's clear to me that that you have at least the, what's expressed in the book is you're not self focused. It's not about you. It's always about others and which walks me into this question my last question for you before i ask you one five so i got two questions this one and the last one which is which is about all of us or none can you talk to us about all of us or none can you talk to us about how how this embodies your philosophy your approach 
Um, hmm. By the way, I wasn't going to name all of us. All of us now, I was going to name it "Save Ourselves" because <laughs> mm. <laughs> I didn't think that anybody was going to show up to save us. Mm. Um, I had a homeboy that taught me how to read without the benefit of a high school diploma. Went to law school, took the California State Bar, and passed us to the California State Bar, and became the administrator of law, law, law judge. Um, his name was Nate Harrington. Uh, when Nate got into a wrestling match with his son, he fell out the window, busted his head wide open, and he died. Uh, the county jail, because he went back to work and quit the job from being an administrative law judge to uh, running legal services, uh, prisoners, uh, prisoners legal services, but the San Francisco County, uh, San Francisco County, you know, you, you know, you usually walk in every once in a while and say, show me a badge. <laughs> but he was there because he was serving the interests of people in jail. Uh, and when he had that horrible day, uh, he, um, they constructed uh, a memorial in, in the name of Nate and put it in the lobby of the jail. Now, what they also put in the memorial was some of Nate's favorite things. Uh, a poem by Bertrand Brett. The name of that poem was All of Us and None. What he put him in his memorial case was uh, uh, one of his favorite books, The Wretched of Earth. What they put in his memorial case was snicker candy bars in which we shared while we were in prison. Uh, and uh, being that they were trying to arrest his son and charge his son, uh, the prior group that I had before all of us now was called Timers. And what we did was organize um, to actually protect Nate's son. We named uh, uh, our author, what he did was just train his son to be a plumber so he can have employment for the rest of his life. Uh, the next thing that we did is that we was giving away bicycles at that time. The next thing that we did was brought them in, in the room and had them give away 50 bicycles to children. He said, your father's shoes is a real big set of shoes and it's going to be hard for you to fulfill it. But maybe you should get a different pair of shoes so you can actually exist and go forward in your life and actually give back. So when we came to all of us or none, I was trying to actually get people to speak in their own voice. I was already a speaker. I was going to all of these other places and people was asking me to speak. Uh, I can remember bring, bring, uh, bringing uh, Big Black that was in the Attica Rebellion uh, to Dolores Park, bringing Angela Davis that was uh, uh, activist, uh, bringing uh, Ida McRae, uh, who, uh, you know, I met her, uh, when I was uh, inside, uh, went to a federal prison and, you know, I asked her a dumb question. Uh, she said she could speak Spanish and she was a black one, but I can tell by when she's kicking it with me, she was really, really black. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and when that jumped off, I asked her, I said, well, you know, don't we have a travel ban? And Ida told me uh, not if she took, uh, she hijacked the plane. So it's like, you know, <laughs> You know, I was like, I, you know, I had some admiration. Like, shit, I ain't never took a plane. I met like, you know, cattle rustlers. <laughs> met a whole bunch of stuff. Never nobody that, that took the plane. But the other thing that she did was that the whole time that she wrote me, uh, what she wrote me about was gentrification in San Francisco. What she wrote me about was her parents was losing the house. And uh, and sometimes there's a guy that goes into prison, you know, sometimes the role changed. And she never, ever deviated from what she wanted politically. You know, when you meet Susan Burton, uh, we never deviated because I was looking for Conrad's. I wasn't looking for anything else. You know, it was a whole bunch of women like Linda Evans. I was looking for Conrad's, you know. Uh, and I can remember when you walked in, Andrea James. <laughs> I was looking for Conrad. So, like, all of that stuff was there. All of us and none meant 
that what we start doing, we start speaking in our own voice. What happens when you can outgrow the role of being a client? Yeah. You know, you know, I can remember suing for a uh, voting rights in, in 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 San Francisco. The first lawsuit we filed, we were uh, the plaintiffs. The next time we filed a suit, we was co counsel. You know, cause like it was a different thing. Cause like they can sue, they can walk away. We can't fund ourselves. We can't do anything. And you know, and they just feel like you know, they, you know, their friends and stuff was. They said you could do it. How do you actually do it? You know, so it's like it's a different thing for passing. Uh, doing having a litigation strategy is another phase to implement a litigation strategy. You know, but the all of us and none component that, that, that we developed, uh, it was, uh, you know, people like uh, hmm, John, Wayne, and a whole bunch of other people that, that was around, and they started having a national voice. Uh, Eddie Ellis was still there, you know, and, and at a certain point, uh, when we started fighting ban the box, uh, it was like we started talking about ending structural discrimination. That's when formerly incarcerated people got active in a in a four different way. Because like one of the things that I wanted to do was resurrect the prison rights movement from 1981. When we started fe feeding them substantive things to do, they started responding in a totally different way. You know, it wasn't like you know. Oh, we are going to pity you. No, you're going to get your ass up and start fighting too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, it, it was a different, it was a different way that, that you, you, you get, get at that stuff. You know, uh, you know, like uh, people with, with all of us and none, uh, we was changing the language, we was changing the landscape. You know, and when I get out, you know, like I got to learn how to talk about the I part of it. Because for a long period of time, everybody that generally got out, they followed me because I got out in 1981. So it was a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of preparation that went into what a lot of people do. Uh, but I can't do those things by myself. You know, uh, I got a Cadillac and only found out that driving it around, I was a lonely person. <laughs> My homies who still like stuck in, in on stupid, you know. Uh, but with all of us and them, when we did a, a ban the box, it wasn't the first time that they had did ban the box. The first people that had did it was uh, uh, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. What we had did was start actually turning it into a mass movement. Uh, and the first time that I seen uh, an application when it was on an application for employment. Uh, I was going through uh, a jack-in-the-box and a guy that was serving me uh, a hamburger uh, and I had already been to El Salvador at that point. And I could recognize his tattoo. It was like, man, this is a gang member. How did, you know, my homeboy standing across the street drinking and smoking weed and stuff. How come they not working? And, they, you know, they was doing structural discrimination. Uh, the next time I ran into it was somebody inside of a uh, uh, doing a housing and they had it and they saying that, you know, if you had a, a drug conviction, uh, you couldn't come into public housing. They didn't even give them the real information. And uh, then I went in and I asked the person for the application. And uh, and when they gave me the application, I looked on the wall and they had an award on the wall. And uh, the last name was um, a guidance and the guidance was out of Louisiana. Slim and a number of other guidance out of Louisiana. And then uh, I asked, uh, I know a Slim guidance. She said, that's my husband. And I said, didn't your son die inside the prison because he had three joints? And they gave him a felony. And before, you know, y'all had the, that massive part of the technology, uh, I blew up all the applications that I can find that was interesting and pull them up to three by three so I can hold them up when I'm doing a presentation because like, you know, uh, I didn't have access to the internet yet. I didn't have that kind of information, that kind of knowledge. And uh, and I showed them. And then when it got down to them marking the application, they said that I was, uh, 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 have I been convicted of a felony while actually applying for a job for a dog catcher? Thought it was a bit much, you know, so I did. <laughs> 
-hmm. you know, and, you know, it, 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 it didn't allow me to, to go forward. But, you know, like uh, in retrospect, you know, and by the way, uh, I ran into a different group of people also. I ran across formerly incarcerated people said, well, we should actually uh, think about if uh, they should uh, ban the box if you did 10 years, uh, been free 10 years. And I was thinking, man, if it's, I don't know if I can make it 10 years without a job. <laughs> I don't know if I can make it 10 years, but, you know, and all of us ain't cut out to hold up the sign like I will work for food, you know, I'll work for free. Some of us ain't going to do that stuff. You know, so I was thinking like that, you know, and uh, that was, you know, his name was Ron, I ain't going to give you his last name. He was in an argument. <laughs> you know, then there was a, another group of people uh, that's there. Uh, and I met um, a student at Stanford uh, and he said something that was so bizarre uh, when he said he objected and he think that we should keep the box uh, on the application. You know, and I was looking at him. I said, man, you know, you know, who is this Negro? And, uh, and uh, you know, and he knew that he had already ruffled me. And because I'm sitting there thinking about, man, I, you know, I should hit him with something. <laughs> you know, I was talking right there in that moment. And he, then, then he made me even more angry. He says, like, you think I sold out? I said, well, yeah, I think you did. Right. And, and, and he told me he didn't sell out, he bought in. And I said, I should hit him with something big. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, then we went to the, 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 the Congressional Black Caucus Legislative Weekend at one point. And we showed up at the, the uh, Legislative Weekend and uh, and uh, when he was there, you know, um, we, they had, we had all worked it out. We was going to do a, a, a panel discussion. He was going to give us space inside of their conference. And um, things I can remember, I can remember um, that we did organizing within the conference and we filled up the space. But people came, it was four of a, 400 of us that we came mm. to uh, 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 Washington, D.C., when we came to Washington, D.C., uh, people uh, had showed up, these formerly incarcerated people. And uh, and uh, some people don't suppose to leave uh, their loved ones uh, above ground for a certain period of time. And they showed up to actually want to come in that fight. And when they didn't give up the room, uh, I can remember that uh, I was cussing as hard. And I was saying, you don't remember motherfucking Fannie Lou Hamer. She came back and I do. Y'all don't remember a goddamn history that includes people fighting. And I do. Uh, and I said, give it good, bad, or ugly. You still got to come back to our neighborhood and you're going to ask us for something. And Elder Freeman, uh, which is, we got a policy fellowship named within legal services of, uh, legal service for prisons for children called the Elder Freeman Policy Fellowship. And we teach formerly incarcerated people and we give them fellowships and pay them $50,000 a year to actually start learning how to do policy work. Uh, because if you're talking, you got to know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but what really came out of that, 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 that work, I can remember um, walking in and he was calling us uh, ex-offenders, ex-convicts, and he was in the massive boom and he was talking about us. I can remember standing up. What I said is, I won't call y'all Negroes. You won't call me ex offender. You don't call me ex convict. You don't call me ex felon. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to start calling y'all Negroes every time I meet you. Because at a certain point, they can't necessarily, the first part of challenging a narrative is the language. You know, it's the language. So when you hear me say some of this stuff, it's the language that I'm challenging. You know, um, some parts of, of, of the work, I think, uh, is remarkable work. It's not only just ban the box. It's not even critical resistance. It's not even the form. 
formerly incarcerated and convicted people and family movement is not uh, all that other stuff. Uh, what I have a problem doing is that in my memoirs, I recognize that I'm not alone. Yeah. All my friends and my, all yeah. my comrades, yeah. we started meeting and we met as just, we were equal. Yeah. The other thing that happened was that some of them became heroes. Yeah. You know, what was it, 20 years before Desmond Meads had figured out like taking the vote back in Florida? <laughs> Norris was Jim Crow old, not Jim Crow new. <laughs> when he was taking back the, that, 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 changing that decision about the vote, and when we was doing structural discrimination and we was ending that for, I think, uh, in the United States, when they asked me, was I crazy? Uh, 267 million people stay in a jurisdiction that has banned the box. Okay. So at a certain point, how do I get to that part? You know, and uh, my homies that I served time with uh, are getting out of prison. And some of them are getting out of prison right now. They don't have any work life left. They have already been enslaved two lifetimes damn near. And uh, what I'm doing and what Paul is probably going to carry on with is that we're building a, a senior citizen center so we can actually incorporate people coming home and have give them a place to live. Because if not, uh, whoever they was in a relationship with, most likely that relationship doesn't exist right now. In the event that their parents is around, their parents is too old to take care of them. How do we take care of the people that came home? Uh, and at a certain point, uh, the generation I came from, they read the same books as I read. And not only did they read the same books that I read, I can remember being back in prison uh, on a visit at DVI. And, uh, and I had somebody stand up and he was talking to a crowd. And the person that was talking to the crowd listed all the books that I had read and I was required to read. That person that was saying that was Danny Glover. Well, some of us Black people sent other Black people books in for us to learn how to do that stuff. You know, uh, the last part of uh, my work is uh, not the book, but the last part of my work is that I want to end slavery in the state of California and I want to end slavery nationally. Because I don't necessarily think that we can actually reform anything unless we outlaw slavery first. You know, whatever minor steps that we have, what they're still thinking is they hold it on to the concept that, they, you know, um, work without consent is slavery. Involuntary servitude is slavery by another name. And uh, I don't necessarily know that I adjusted to uh, them forcing the labor. Uh, the thing that probably saved my life was that I, I uh, adjusted to the fact that they weren't my friends and I needed to resist. What educated me was that I needed uh, to ultimately write my children who I thought that everybody around me that when I get out was too old. And when I was 19, I was examining uh, uh, the length of time that the average black man lives. And I assumed that if I had outlived that, everybody else was going to be too old to care for me. You know, what I needed to do was to actually convey stuff uh, there. And I think that um, it's probably one of the things that I, I wanted to give. I know the difference be between regret and remorse. And I regretted a whole bunch of stuff that I did. Remorse was something that I didn't get a chance to actually achieve and actually think about until I thought I had an experience. When I wasn't being threatened and my life wasn't in danger, I was able to actually grasp that. When I was in the middle of writing this book, uh, at the beginning of writing this book, uh, 
my great granddaughter was graduating from uh, junior high school. And uh, and I'm sitting there because I know that I'm going to give her some money. You know, all the rest of the family is going to hug her. We're going to love on her and all the rest of it. But I was thinking about that day was uh, who hugs on the children of my victim. That's getting into remorse. When people were trying to kill me, shooting tear gas on me, beating me up, I was thinking about like how to survive or how to get them back. That right there is something that I learned in a different way. And I learned that in a loving way because people was around me. Um, I think as a result of uh, people seeing me, um, I went from being Dorsey to Dare. I went from uh, not having education to have people that followed me in my family stream, in my family line. Uh, that granddaughter that's in Clark, great granddaughters in Clark. I got a granddaughter in Arizona State. I got a daughter in uh, a great uh, uh, granddaughter in USC. I got a daughter that graduated and in, in, in a granddaughter graduated from Cal State Hayward. All of this, I am so immensely proud of uh, because at a certain point, uh, and by the way, uh, they're going to show the world a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. They're going to show uh, the shortcoming of men. They're going to show you know, something, some, some, some arguments I didn't got in with, like, what, my granddaughters? It's like, oh, damn, you know, <laughs> you talking to me like that? <laughs> I feel like this is a, the, the perfect place to end. Okay. I mean, we, we, we've walked through, Dorsey, your life, we, we, and now we've learned about the next generation. If I were to ask you one 20-second question, which is probably not a 20-second question, but, but if it was 30 seconds, what would you say you are the most proud of in this moment? The woman that's in this room with me had my child when I was 16. And she still loves me. We, we, we'd love to hear from folks here. Thank you, thank you. First of all, let's thank Dorsey again. Good. Incredible book, incredible work, incredible life. Incredible words to us. We'd love to hear from folks, maybe a couple people who might have thoughts, questions. Please, the mic's coming. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. So I'm Valencia, I'm from Miami, and um. I've been following your organization to work for years, but it was a few things that you said that struck me. So I'm 40 years old now. And um, you said when you were born, like you were labeled a Negro. And I'm like, I was born in 84. My birth certificate says Negro. <laughs> and I was like, wow. You know, just, you know, to see how language has evolved in some places faster than others uh, brought up something for me. But the um, thing about how you would like pass out bikes to kids who um, parents who are were incarcerated um, brought up such a deep memory for me. My mother served seven years in um, federal prison when I was maybe like nine or 10 years old. So I still remember the days like during the holidays when like these groups would come and be like, your mom told us to bring you these things. And me and my four siblings used to jump for joy every single year. And I just wanted to share that story with you um, as a recipient of that type of organizing and programming. 
and how much joy and connectivity um, it brought for me and my mother. And my mother is now clean at home and alive and everything. And I'm really grateful for that, y'all, because a lot of people don't have that. But um, I still have um, this one doll. It was a cheerleader doll that I got from one of the programs when I was 11 and it still sits in my house to this day. So I just wanted to let you know, like as a recipient, I am so grateful that you and other comrades were thinking like that because as a child who was living, you know, born with cracking her system, my parents incarcerated and things like that, it got real scary. And um, just to have somebody thinking about us was super good. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, it's very nice to meet you. I'm also from California and, um, you know, I've noticed there are so many people um, from Alabama and Louisiana, and I'm wondering like, where did your parents come from? North. We still got bricks being sold in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm still holding it down. Bricks ain't gonna die, dog. <laughs> Peace. Um, my name is Bridgette Simpson. I just go by Bree. Um, you said a quote that I'm probably gonna print out and put somewhere. Um, some people are drawn to religion and I'm drawn to revolution. That is life changing. Just wanted to give you a big ashe for that. That is absolutely life changing. First, I want to say, man, yeah, you know much I appreciate you. I love you. Mm -hmm. And I say it because, man, you. And, you know, I know these affirmations, sometimes we don't like to get them, but, you know, man, you are my hero because I saw in you what was possible for me. And the fact that you gave me the privilege to read your manuscript said a whole lot about the relationship that we have. And your leadership, man, has meant a whole lot to all of us in this movement. You know, and sometimes we don't kind of like, because we see ourselves as being peers, but some of us are kind of like just a little bit in front of the next person. And so, I mean, I really hold you up, man, in a way, man, that at the end of the day, if you're kind of like just people come and see me and like, ooh, 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 and I'll be laughing to myself and saying, yeah, I got that from Dorsey. <laughs> and so, no, no. So, because a lot of things, I mean, people, you know, need to say these things because, bro, you have meant so much for us coming together as a collective. It was that clarion call for, hey, man, look, I have an idea. Let's see, can we pull it together? If it don't be for that, it wouldn't be a such thing as FICPFM. Uh, for everybody to kind of like check their egos at the door, come in the room, we can get some work done. And so for all this stuff, man, ban the box. I'm, you know, reading, you know, I was reading the manuscript about our foray into the White House, you know, and about, pushing somebody, the highest person in office in this country, to use that obscure term of banning the box 10 days after we visited him, and then 10 days later, he made an announcement that he's going to ban the box. That was huge. That was the hugest thing. So when he just asked the question about, man, what was the proudest moment? And I would think that was it, because we went from the outhouse, the back, big house, and everywhere else, but we went to the White House. And we got somebody to do something that other people told us wasn't even possible. But that was because you had vision. And so, bro, I want to kind of like really lift that up in this moment, man, because I don't know how many people are going to read the book, you know? Billions. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. But we got to continue to tell that story. We got to tell that story about what we heard because we can't regurgitate everything that Darcy says or does. But Darcy has made an impact from the West Coast to the East Coast to the South to the Midwest, all over this country, that some of the work that he's done is being emulated and replicated by other people because he created a roadmap. So when you ask, when somebody asks you, 
what their contribution is, man. You got to tell people. I make shit happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I just want to follow Norris. Um, I had a chance to talk to Susan Burton a couple of weeks ago, and she was telling me about how you all used to split the cost for rooms and airplane tickets. And she was telling me that to tell me that she was proud of where the movement has grown and the seeds that you all planted, she was happy to see that that harvest was continuing to grow. And I just want to say that people who have been incarcerated, when we come out, we could make a we could have we could say, I'm gonna go off and do something else and be successful, start a business, whatever. But you answered the call and you said yes, and you've continued to say yes. And in my small journey compared to yours in this work, sometimes I'm like, I want to quit. I don't want to do this. But what inspires me is seeing you and what you've been able to do. And that inspires me to continue in this work. So I just want to say I love you and appreciate you. Sure, sure, sure. Just one more. I just want to say I love you, uh, Dorsey and um, Norris and Sue. Um, through all the years, all my tantrums, all my growing, all my learning, um, you guys really uh, created a path for us, and um, we know that. And we te we tell people, like Norris said, we have to be very clear about who helped us find the way and who opened the doors. And um, we do do that, Dorsey. And I love you because no matter what, you've always loved me. And I appreciate you and Norris and Sue uh, for that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think from these last comments, you can see uh, that there really wasn't a better person to have kick off this conversation over the next day and a half. Uh, we're so honored to be in your presence. We're honored to be inheritors of your work uh, and to try to carry on uh, the legacy of lifting up um, the voices of directly impacted people trying to pose hard questions of justice to the state, to society, and to this institution, um, which has far too often played its biggest role on the other side of these questions. Uh, so I'm honored to, to be here today. I hope you all join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. We'll be right back here in this space. Uh, I wanna thank our moderator, uh, Ruben yes. Jonathan Miller, I want to thank um, all of the great people at the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research, Kingsley, Justin, Sandra, Velma, and Abby uh, for their support, and always all praise due to Henry Louis Gates Jr. for his leadership uh, and vision and creating a space where each of us can pursue our own efforts and leadership and vision. Um, if you haven't had a chance, we have copies for every member of our audience of Dorsey's book, What Kind of Bird Can't Fly? A Memoir of Resilience and Resurrection. Please pick up your copy, get it signed. Uh, and we are so thankful to Dorsey and Ruben for their beautiful conversation. Round of applause, please. Um, just a quick word when, while Mr. Nunn is signing the books, you can line up this way. Um, we're going to just play some clips from the project that he mentioned, uh, out in California. I don't know if you want to say just a, a quick second about what these videos are from as people start lining up, but, um, we're just going to have those playing in the background. So hey, you'll um, know what you're listening to. Uh, what, what, what this is, it's like, uh, we, um, had a project, I want, uh, 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 a California Leadership uh, Award, an Irvine Foundation Award. And attached to that award, uh, 
uh, you know, they gave me a gave the organization, uh, uh, I think, a quarter million dollars. Then they gave uh, an additional hundred thousand uh, dollars for capacity, uh, capacity building. And, uh, and I knew that I was getting ready to retire because I, uh, I was getting closer and closer to paying off the building. And uh, so we decided that what we want to do is uh, put up billboards across the state of California uh, to, um, to indicate uh, that we are still in the practice in the midst and in the grits of uh, practicing slavery in the state. Um, and uh, we designed some things and uh, the billboards uh, companies refuse to allow us to put the billboards up even when we could pay them. And then what we decided to do uh, and you know we went through all the protocols uh, that's not people have the people that's uh, designing the artwork and all the rest of that stuff come from inside the prison and actually show their artwork at the same time we carrying a message. And um, and when they didn't do it, uh, what we ultimately did was uh, did a, a, got a big projector and we went to the state capitol and we projected the images on the side of the state capitol. Uh, we projected the images on the side of the county jail. Uh, and uh, some of the images that you will see, that ultimately we're going to be asking somebody to actually send it around. Because what's relevant in California is probably relevant nationally because we're still practicing uh, the residue of slavery as is, is articulated in uh, the 13th Amendment. So we see if, you know, and by the way, I hadn't seen this whole piece of it edited. Yeah, a big thank you to Trey Borden and his company for sharing. But please feel free. Uh, that concludes tonight to line up, get your book. Hey, sorry, just one last thing. Yeah. Uh, just one last set of thank yous. Uh, we also want to thank our co-sponsors. Um, they're a group of undergraduate students who have been really instrumental in making this happen. Uh, they're the Harvard Organization for Prison Education and Advocacy. So many of them are in attendance today. I want to thank them for their work and our friends over at the Harvard Law School at the Institute to End Mass Incarceration. I want to thank them as well. So, so. I think that we all can agree that consent is something that's sacred when it comes to incarcerating people for whatever reason. We've left this population vulnerable and it's kind of like, well, once you're incarcerated, you know, you lose that right. And, and you get to just be forced into whatever the state deems is necessary. The punishment will be being removed from society. I should be able to consent to work. Exactly. Right. We want to give incarcerated people the right to voluntary, intelligent, and informed consent to any and all labor. Do, here's a pen. We gonna give you a forward job. <laughs> The uh, industry that we're going up against is a billion. <laughs> Your food could be produced by slave labor. The furniture that's in state buildings could be produced by slave labor. People picking up paper and refuge, it could be produced by slave labor. The system makes so much money for them. How many millions of dollars are they saving or making from in the labor? Yeah, I think California prison industry a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of money, thirty million in all. Now I can't even afford to buy my soul. Yeah. And on top of that, a lot of the mm -hmm. products, probably that Starbucks cup that you're drinking, um, probably had some something to do with incarcerated labor at some point. Yeah, we, we at a certain point. <laughs> when do we get out the denial? of the state of California is holding so. slaves. But we'll see. <laughs> oh, okay.
Yeah, hopefully they're all there tomorrow. But we are meeting for breakfast at the Hutch Coast. If you wanted to do that, if you wanted like a more intimate, but like it's fine it's just to just get yeah. it right before they start. And if I don't get it, then I'll do it at the end. Okay. Yeah, because there isn't like a pet to get out. No. Yes. No. So I'll get it. Yeah. I'll get it. I'll get it. Fabulous. Thank you. Yes. Well, Day one down. Thank you. What I want to do is stop the practice of sleep. That's what I want. In sleep, and because at a certain point, I think that uh, we can't move forward as a society unless that happens. I'm a person and I'm a human being. I don't want to be a convict. I want to be a human being first. And I want to refer to me as a human being. Slavery does not do any good for our society. You're not on the right side of history. I don't care what they did or who they are. We shouldn't be enslaving human beings. No. I'm on the Hutchinson Center. Um, so, like, where we're doing like, breakfast and stuff tomorrow. So, I'm in the event for me. Oh, the or? I didn't catch the name of the or. Um, but I think, you know, I don't know what students were there from. Is there a club on campus that, like, one of our great students? Or yeah. I don't know. I just got here in November, so I'm still relatively new. Um, it might be a really great question, but I think Professor yeah. Carey would probably know, or maybe even Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, they both are going to be
I um, I have to apologize. I did say that I really did not. I really shouldn't. We're just a few days away from March. Okay. And I have so much more to do. Okay. I was not here for you know, doing dinner. But you know about the um in motion of the panel about the round table tomorrow? Are you available? No, I can't get here. So okay. Okay. It's just kind of that because I want got to you. hear Norris. Yeah. But um. Yeah. Okay. I, I just can't. I would love. No. 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 